So Nick Chen, thank you for joining us on this Saturday evening. I remember driving home from the hospital for the first time with my wife and newly born baby. And I remember this thought, this is it. This is it. No more doctors, no more nurses, no more midwives. The awesome parenting responsibility dawned on us and we didn't know what to expect. Being in this moment was very different from preparing for it because now we were in the deep end of parenting. My wife and I were both eager and nervous about what's ahead. Some of the hours that we had were overwhelming. Some days were tiring. Whether, but whether we were prepared or ready for it or not, we had to conquer the first weeks of parenting a newborn. That was like 10 years ago and it still felt like yesterday. Now, some of you here, every person here would have experienced going through something for the very first time. And if you have gone through something for the first time, you may feel uncertain or excited. Um, and maybe you are starting a new course in a new school, or maybe you are feeling apprehensive or inadequate about starting a new job or a new posting. Now you see, after Jesus ascended to heaven, I reckon that the disciples, now without their leader, might have also experienced a mixture of emotions. You know, just like how I ask, well, what's next in parenting? Some of you may ask, what's next in this new job or in this new school? I think the disciples, one of the questions that, may, that they may have been asking was, what's next? So let's find out what happened next. I'm reading to you from Acts chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. And in this passage, we learn that after Jesus' resurrection, he spent 40 days with his disciples, instructing them to wait in Jerusalem for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So this is what the Word of God says, verse 3. Jesus presented himself alive to the apostles after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, in Luke chapter 24, verse 49 to 53, and then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 to 9, they both give us a similar account of what happened when Jesus ascended to heaven. Jesus promised his disciples the Holy Spirit who would empower them to be his witnesses throughout the world before he ascended to heaven. So I'm reading from Luke chapter 24, starting from verse 49. And behold, I, who is Jesus, am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. While Jesus blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up to heaven. Imagine that scene, right? And verse 52, And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And then they were in the temple continually blessing God. And this is what Jesus said to them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Verse 9, and when Jesus said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Quite drama, don't you think? A very drama scene. And this is then when we get to the day of Pentecost. Some of you will know that Pentecost is a Greek word that literally means the 50th day. 50th day, that's Pentecost. And this 50th day is based on the timeline of the Passover. This day is significant because Jews scattered all over the region, they will return to Jerusalem for this Jewish pilgrimage festival. Now, for those of you who want to know how the day of Pentecost in the New Testament is linked to the Feast of Harvest in the Old Testament, this QR code that's going to come on screen will lead you to a message explaining this concept. There's a lot in there and there's not enough time in this sermon, so I'll point you to another sermon that will lead you to understand what this concept is about. Feast of Harvest in the Old Testament, Day of Pentecost in the New Testament. 
Now today, we will focus on how the apostles were empowered by the Holy Spirit to be effective witnesses for Jesus. Say effective witnesses. And here's our big idea. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit empowered all believers to be effective witnesses for Christ. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit empowered all believers to be effective witnesses for Christ. In this passage, we see two things that the Spirit has empowered us to do in the passage that I'm going to preach from today. Two things. Number one, to move from fear to faith. And number two, to be effective witnesses for Christ. And next gen, I have good news. The power to be effective witnesses is available to all believers. All believers. So let's get to our first point. And here's my first point. The Holy Spirit empowers us to move from fear to faith. The Holy Spirit empowers us to move from fear to faith. Now, we are approaching the day of Pentecost in the biblical narrative, and this is what happened on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So not too long ago, they saw, they were talking with Jesus, and then they saw Jesus lifted on a cloud. They continued praying. And now, as they were praying, suddenly got fire come down, rest on each of them, mighty rushing wind, and they start speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them this ability. So let's do some calendar dating here. We know from Acts 1 to 3, or Acts chapter 1 verse 3, earlier on, that Jesus was with his disciples as in his resurrected form for 40 days. Right? 40 days. And we also just read from Acts chapter 2 verse 1 that the Spirit descended upon them on Pentecost, the 50th day from the Sabbath after Passover. So, in this passage that we are reading today, the many days from now, in Acts chapter 1 verse 5, it meant a 10-day wait. Now, we all say 10 days very casually because we have hindsight of when the Holy Spirit descended upon the believers. But imagine if you are in the upper room with them or in the temple with them or in Jerusalem with them and you were waiting day after day, half hour after hour, not knowing when the promise of the Father would come. You will be like in this perpetual J triple tree. Right? You'll be praying again and again and again. I cannot imagine, right? Hannah would have to lead like maybe 4,000 songs. Singing non-stop, praying and praising the Lord. Come and would do service leader. Don't know how many times. All the different transitions because they were all waiting for the Holy Spirit to descend upon them. Now, these believers were simply obeying Jesus' order in Acts chapter 1 verse 4 and in Luke chapter 24 verse 49, not to depart Jerusalem and wait. Now, if Jesus tells you before you see him lifted up in a cloud, wait, what would you do? How would you have responded? I think most of us here would wait. But after our stomach start grumbling, we would stop waiting. We would just move on with life, right? Now, let's go back to that upper room where I imagine the believers huddling together. They just spent 40 days with Jesus and they witnessed Him ascending to heaven. So as you witness your Master ascending to heaven, all His teachings were now flashbacks in their minds. All His words were now engraved in their hearts. If I were there, the two questions I'll be asking would be, okay, what's next? And then, I also ask, uh, what now? These two questions are answered by Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, B, the second part of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, answers what's next. What's next is that they will be Jesus' witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
And the first part of Acts chapter 1 verse 8 answers what now? What's going to happen now after being told to wait is that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon them. So don't miss this next gen. The empowerment of the Spirit, whether then or now, was for us to be an effective witness for Jesus to others. To others. The baptism in the Spirit isn't an inward-looking, self-validating, feel-good experience or a badge we pin on our Christian uniform as we move from exploring Christ to being Christ-centered. It's far more than that. In other words, the Holy Spirit empowers you not just to build you up. He empowers you, yes, to build you up, but it's not just that. In this context that we have just read, the Holy Spirit empowers you to witness to others who have not yet known God. That's the purpose of the Spirit's empowerment. Now you see, throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit of God and the activities of the Spirit were commonly symbolized by wind and fire. Now what we need to catch from this passage isn't how loud the rushing wind is. What we need to catch from this passage isn't how hot the tongues of fire felt on each of them. What we need to catch from this passage is that God was clearly there with the believers and the Spirit rested on each of them. Clearly signifying a personal relation with, relationship with God through the Spirit. In other words, each believer met with God in a powerful and tangible way. You couldn't miss it. It was impossible to deny the feeling the wind. Imagine the, the wind, right? And it's impossible to deny seeing the fire. Then something incredible happened. They were filled with the Spirit and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So first, wait. They prayed together, right? Second, they felt the wind. Third, they saw the fire. Now, they hear other languages. This was an unprecedented 4D Christian experience for the believers. Four-dimensional. Now, remember I said that a key purpose of the Spirit's empowerment was to be a witness to others? This purpose took place immediately. The Holy Spirit gave the believers the supernatural ability to speak about the mighty works of God in a language not familiar to them. Now, we'll talk about this language in my next point, but right now, I want, to pay, I want us to pay some attention to, the, to some key words here. In this passage, it records, they began to speak. They began to speak. The believers present were all filled with the Spirit, and their witnessing began immediately with them speaking. In this context, in other tongues. Now, the believers moved from fear of, they, they had a fear of moving into the future without the physical presence of their leaders, and now they were moving into faith, putting their faith in God for what snakes. Remember this upper room uh, uh, scene of them huddling together, and then they experienced this mixed emotions after Jesus ascended? Their, this was their purpose. Their, this was when their purpose to be witnesses for Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 became clear. After this Holy Spirit experience, they were now on mission. Being filled with the Spirit meant that they weren't alone in this mission, but they were empowered to fulfill Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is a major transformation for them because from bunching in a room, waiting for the promise of the Father, to being bold witnesses for Jesus. Now, did their fears disappear? Probably not. But boldness helped them to face it. Now, you see, next gen, the Spirit doesn't erase your fear, but equips you with the courage to face your fear and to share your faith despite your anxieties. God is with us through the Holy Spirit. The very first time I remember my distinctive Holy Spirit experience was at a grace retreat when I was in secondary school. When we returned from KL that weekend, I was so eager to be used by God that I did something crazy after youth service and after Sunday school ended. 
See, the plan was to go to my best friend's house after lunch to play Risk, the board game. Have you all played this before? Okay, I think it's a, it's a very ancient game. Some of you might know this game. But when we got to my best friend's place, we saw his father fully reclined in his full body massage chair. So I greeted uncle, who was half closing his eyes because he was relaxing, right? And then we said, oh, hello, uncle. Then he said, hi, son. Hi, Joey. <laughs> then without fear and clearly without thinking much, I shot from the hip and I said, uncle, are you baptized in the spirit? So, so imagine that, right? He's like down there and we are like opening the door. Hello, uncle. Hey, hi, son. Hi, Joey. Uncle, are you baptized in the spirit? He looked at us. Frankly, I don't recall how he replied, but I remember that events that day, that afternoon, it escalated very quickly. Next thing you know, my best friend and I were laying hands on his semi-awake father. We had no idea what we were doing, but we were speaking in the spirit and also praying with understanding. And get this, this entire time as we lay our hands on him, the massage chair was still operating. Okay? We could hear its vibration and we could see uncle's shoulder moving gently up and down as we were praying for him. And this is what happened. I remember I was, I was so filled, right? I laid my hands on him and I said, in the name of Jesus. Then you hear, uh, 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 fill uncle with uh, uh, fire. That was me, 14 years old, right? 14, 15 years old. Imagine that scene. And before you know it, uncle started speaking in the spirit. It was crazy. So imagine that scene, a dimly lit living room on the third floor of a Red Hill flat. That was my best friend and I, our Pentecost experience. And maybe, maybe, you know, to tomorrow that uncle will hear this testimony. He will be in that service, right? And maybe uncle was just being kind and encouraging and just prayed along with us. But he will not deny the faith-filled actions of his son and his best friend. That afternoon, the budding faith levels of two spirit-filled teenagers grew so exponentially that they were convinced God could change their world. And then two of us teenagers, we did what we intended to do that afternoon. After the Holy Spirit experience, we went to play Risk. <laughs> and the caption on the board game couldn't be more appropriate. If you can show that screen again, will you take over the world? <laughs> and on hindsight, it was as if God was asking the both of us, will you let me take over your world? You know, perhaps this was the catalyst for us as we began serving God. Today, I'm serving on the church staff. And if you pay attention to our ECB uh, poster just now, he is serving on the church board. You know, I have been a believer for barely a year when this happened. But when I was filled with the Spirit, God empowered me to be a witness, even when it didn't make logical sense. Even when I was young in age and faith, and even when I wasn't sure what to do next, I just desired to obey God. Now, what's my point here? When the Spirit fills us, He moves us from fear of not knowing what to do to faith in God to do what He prompted us to do. That's point number one, to move from fear to faith. Point number two, my final point. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be effective witnesses for Christ. I'm reading from Acts chapter 2, verse 5 to 12. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, the sound of the rushing wind and what was going on in the prayer place. And these Jews, devout men from every nation, they were bewildered because each one was hearing them, that means the people who were praying and the Holy Spirit descended upon them, speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Aren't all, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of them in, in his own native language, 
Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pont Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Now you see, the day of Pentecost was also referred to as the Feast of Harvest. And because it was the Feast of Harvest, it probably made Jerusalem feel like a bustling international marketplace. Because you have Jews coming from all over the region, coming back to Jerusalem for this festival. And the author is very um, intentional here. He, he, he actually wrote that there were 16 different people groups mentioned in the passage that we just read. So imagine the various nations gathered and each of them, because they come from a different place, they were all speaking in their unique dialects, their own mother tongue, if we can say that. In Acts chapter 2 verse 8, we learn that the travelling Jews were amazed and astonished that these Galilean believers were speaking in the native languages of the 16 locales listed. Now, earlier on, we learned that the believers were speaking in the languages, in, in other languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So, we will get into that now. Don't confuse this language in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, with the heavenly tongues Paul described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, chapter 12 to 14. This this language here, it wasn't an angelic and unknown language that the author was describing, but it was a decipherable and recognizable language understood by the different people groups represent. Now, it's just like when you go overseas, you would hits up if you suddenly hear somebody speak Singlish, right? You will suddenly recognize the accent and you will recognize the language. So imagine the shock of the traveling Jews when they heard these Galilean Jews, all Jews but different parts of the region, they heard these traveling Jews speaking in the mother tongue of the place that they came from. This miracle of speaking in other languages broke down language barriers and opened the hearts of the diaspora Jews, that means the scattered Jews, to God's mighty works. You see, a connection happens when you speak the heart language of the person you are witnessing to. It's, but whether it's using an actual language like English, using a Chinese dialect, or using a generational slang, like Gen Z language, right? We somehow connect better when we speak the same lingo. You see, effective witnessing involves getting people to hear about the mighty works of God in a way that makes a connection with them. The Holy Spirit empowers all believers to be witnesses for Jesus by helping us to connect heart to heart with the people we are trying to reach. The Spirit opens up and softens the, the heart of the people we are witnessing to by convicting them of their sin and their need for Christ to save them. My friends, true conversion comes from God's transformative power at work within individuals. And then, of course, I've already mentioned this, the author intentionally listed 16 places and people groups individually. Why did he do that? You see, the, the author here was alluding to what had happened at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, when Yahweh dispersed the nations and allotted them the, to the sons of God. This dispersion was also mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7 to 8, when Yahweh disinherited the nations but wanted to reclaim them back through the Jews. Now, if you are first time hearing about this and you go like, Pastor, what are you talking about? You can scan this QR code. That will take you back to a message in our Supernatural Realm sermon series some years back. Okay? Now, with this as our backdrop, with this understanding in our backdrop, we now get an insight into how speaking in other languages was the Spirit's way of reaching out to the Jewish diaspora in the disinherited nations. All the nations that I've listed down just now when I was reading the text. And this is important in helping us to understand that the Pentecostal experience, 
The purpose of the Pentecostal experience wasn't just to, to, to mark a Holy Spirit experience, but it was to raise witnesses in the nations. I say this again. It's not just to mark a Holy Spirit experience, but it is to raise witnesses in the nations. The Pentecost experience is much more than what we can experience. It's about God's heart for the nations so that we may be empowered to be witnesses for Christ to others and continue the mission of God. The Spirit's intention in empowering the disciples to speak in other tongues wasn't just to praise God's mighty works or, or astound and amaze the travelling Jews. It was to reach out to these Jews so that they could be witnesses for Christ back in their own nations. You see, being effective witnesses for Christ it's about God working through us to communicate His mighty works, to live a Christ-like life, and to share our faith in a way that touches others and moves them to return to God. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. So therefore, let us ask the Spirit to empower us to use whatever means possible to connect with and to reach out to others. Not just in recognizable languages, but also with our actions as we are guided by the Holy Spirit. When I was working in Shanghai many years ago, I was prompted by the Spirit to share my conversion story with a local lady over a casual dinner with mutual friends. And of course, I was in Shanghai. I shared my testimony in Mandarin, no less. She ended up joining my small group for a short while, and attended the international service before she shifted to the locals, local service there to be discipled there because they all spoke in Mandarin. Before my grandmother passed away, I told her about Jesus and led her to Christ four times because she has dementia. So I have to do it again and again, right? And I did it in broken grandma, grandson Mandarin. My Chinese was questionable, but God's grace was not questionable. She somehow, in her dementia state, she somehow understood what I was saying and she gave her life to Jesus four times, just to be sure. Recently, uh, recently at a gathering at my neighbor's house, and they were all non-believers, I felt the Holy Spirit's prompting to share how I became a Christian and I did it when they asked how I became a pastor or why I become a pastor. Only this time, I had to use a mixture of Mandarin, Teochew, and Hokkien. My dialect speaking neighbor described my dialect as chubi, which means cute, because he's tickled by the way that I speak it. It was broken all the way. But pray along with me, pray along with me that one day this family will come to know Jesus as well. Now, when I look back at the different occasions God used me to witness to non believers in the past and recently, it was hardly ever to use bombastic English words. It was hardly ever to use the theological jargon that I learned from my Bible college. Yeah, we could use that. I could speak to them like I'm preaching to you now, but somehow God used me in my weaknesses. Instead, I experienced the empowerment of the Spirit through my weaknesses and inadequacies. It was the Spirit who empowered me to be an effective witness for Christ. My friends, we may feel limited, but the Spirit who has unlimited power is willing to empower us. Amen? Church, even when we face communication breakdowns or language deficiencies, the Spirit can still empower us to tell others about what God has done in our lives. Being effective witnesses for Christ doesn't come from our own strength, but in what the Spirit can do in the hearts of others. So next gen, how should we practically respond to the Word? We don't need to look too far for an opportunity to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be effective witnesses for Christ. There's always a family member who doesn't know God or who needs to be discipled. There's always a classmate or colleague whom you can share the wonderful things God has done in your life. The people whom God wants us to witness to are closer than we think. Some of us here might feel that being empowered by the Spirit to move from fear to faith or being effective witnesses for Christ 
is something that only bold or gifted or experienced Christians can do. Maybe you've been a believer for some time now and you've always hoped for a breakthrough in your walk with God. Today, we learn that the Spirit is willing to empower not some, but all believers. So friends, this power is available for you. Turn to someone beside you and say that power is available for you. Available for you. Church, we don't need to wait for wind and fire to take a step of faith. The key is obedience and trusting that the Spirit will work through us. Next gen, we can always start small. We don't need to give grand speeches, but most of us can share about one wonderful thing that God has done in your life. Correct? You can share about one wonderful thing that God has done in your life. And as you do your part in obeying the prompting of the Spirit and connecting with people, remember that the Spirit is working in their hearts. The Spirit is going ahead of you and speaking to them and convicting them. Now, if you don't have a simple sharing, it's time to prepare one. If you already have one, it's time to rehearse your sharing. If you're already familiar with your sharing, it's time to share it with someone else. Whether it's in a language or lingo, in whatever language or lingo for that moment. And trust that the Spirit will empower you to move from fear to faith. Now, being effective witnesses for Christ means that we're constantly looking out for opportunities to connect with people, be it with a classmate, be it with someone you work with or work out with, be it someone from your office, your school or your neighborhood, be it with the barista or uncle you get your coffee from, be it with your random private hire driver. If God could use Galilean Jews to reach diaspora Jews from other nations, then God can use you to reach the many nations in Singapore. Next gen, let's trust the Spirit to work in the hearts of others even if they don't convert. Don't underestimate how the Spirit can cultivate the seeds you've planted in someone. Remember, the Spirit empowers us to be effective witnesses, not converters. Leave the work of conversion to the Spirit. You may feel inadequate and limited, but remember you are being empowered by the Spirit who is unlimited and is more than enough for you. Church, the power to be effective witnesses for Christ is available for all believers. And I know that God is speaking to some of you already throughout this service. And perhaps today, God is asking you, will you let me take over your will? Will you let me take over your will? So right now, I believe that it's time for us to respond to the Spirit's prompting in our hearts right now. With all eyes closed, with all heads bowed, I'd like to speak to two groups of people. Some of you have a strong desire to move from fear to faith. You don't know what to do next to grow in your walk with God, but you know that God wants you to take a step out in faith. The key to obeying what God has prompted you to do is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And like all believers and like the believers in Acts, you desire today to be baptized in the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. We want to facilitate that for you. So today you're saying, Pastor, I want to grow in my walk with God. I want to be an effective witness. I want to experience growth. I want to experience the Holy Spirit's power and fire in my life. And you feel that prompting in you, and you're saying, Pastor, would you pray for me today? If that is you, would you raise your hand to the Lord? Thank you, thank you, thank you. You've sung consuming fire, fan into flame, and you're saying to the Lord right now, God, fan it into flame. Increase my love for you. Increase my compassion for you. Increase my love for the world, for your people, for the lost. Increase that in me. Lord, would you 
baptize me today in the Spirit. If that is you, and you're not yet baptized in the Spirit, would you raise your hand to the Lord? We want to pray with you. If you desire that, would you raise your hand to the Lord? I see a couple of hands in front. Thank you. I see your hands. See your hand at the back there. We're going to open up the altars later. Your leaders and the pastoral staff are here. We want to pray with you. And we want to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just like what happened in Acts, we pray that it happens to you as well. The second group of people I want to speak with are those of you here who feel a burning desire to be witnesses for Christ. God has reignited you, in you a burden to share with others what He has done for you, using you to be an effective witness to others. So if that is you, you're saying, Pastor, I want to be an effective witness and I need the Spirit's power in my life in order to do that. If that is you, would you raise your hand to the Lord as well? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, I see your hand, thank you. I see your hand, I see your hand aside, thank you. Thank you. Shall we all stand to our feet? As the worship team leads us to worship the Lord, right now, the altars are open. If you want to be baptized in the Spirit, if you want to be empowered to be an effective witness, if you want to move from fear to faith, then why don't you come forward to the front? Let us pray with you. Let us pray that the Lord will empower you and baptize you in the Spirit. Let's worship the Lord, shall we? All of us. Let's worship the Lord right now. Spirit sound rushing wind, fire of God fall within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us. The altars are open. I want to invite you to come forward. And be prayed for if you have raised your hands just now. Turn from sin, revival, ember, smoldering, breath of God, fed us into flame. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out, a holy anointing. The power of your presence, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Spirit sound, spirit sound, rushing wind. Come, church, let us worship the Lord right now. Holy Ghost, wherever you are, why don't you ask the Lord to fill you right now? Wherever you are, why don't you ask the Lord to empower you right now? Church, why don't we raise our hands to the Lord? Let us be in a posture of receiving. And let us ask the Lord to give us courage. Let us ask the Lord to give us faith. To move in the Spirit. Hallelujah, Lord. 